When I breathe in, I'll breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I'll breathe out love. When I breathe in, I'll breathe in peace. When I breathe out, UCE remains a vital part of the world and our community. And because we need one another, we take this time to invite you to give to our shared plate. Today's offering will be shared with my block, my hood, my city, and to Brian Stevenson's Equal Justice Initiative. You can find more information about both of these in the show more section below. Please give as generously as you are able and may what you give bring you joy. You can text to give, send in a check or give from our website. If you do send in a check, please indicate in the memo line if your check is for the shared offering, pledge, capital campaign, or some other giving. Thank you for your generosity.
sunset shouted her most landed shackled kill, and the voices drift up from below as the walls are being scaled. Yes, all this and more, my friend, your song shall not. I can make you laugh, maybe I can try, I'm just looking for the evening and the morning in your Our sacred text for reflection this week is chapter 15 of the Tao Te Ching. Do you have the patience to wait till your mud settles and the water is clear? This perhaps always appealed to me because having clear water or a clear mind in this case doesn't come easily to me. I usually have endless tasks of to-dos, things to do, people to see, appointments, all running in my head at once and my mind can become really good at multitasking and remembering things. But when it comes to being mindful, it's far more challenging. I've been wondering during this time of pandemic if meditation and self-care is a real luxury and feeling kind of guilty if that's the best use of my time during a really strenuous and demanding time. My meditation teacher was reflecting on this question and he responded in a way that I think is really wise. Um, that what we do to show up for ourselves, for clarity of mind, has a direct impact on the people around us. So even if we're not living with other people, we interact with uh, one another, even in quarantine, whether that's by phone or by computer, or even uh, a stranger six feet away on a walk outside. So I found it really interesting going back to this text to find that even in the translations themselves, there is this connection between the inner undisturbed state and the outer state. So in my preferred translation by Stephen Mitchell is the one that I just read to you. Do you have the patience to wait till your mud settles and the water is clear? The second translation I wanna share with you is just slightly different. It says, who can wait quietly while the mud settles? Now this is a question, the first one is directed directly to the reader or the listener. Now this one is bigger, it's saying who among us in our whole community can do that? Now the third one I think is very interesting. The second one is translated by Ju Fu Feng and Jane English. The last one I want to share with you is who can by stillness, little by little, make what is troubled grow clear. So in the original text, there is a connection between, and it can be interpreted in English in all these different ways, that what is happening in our internal uh, state uh, can then affect what in the external world is troubled to grow clear. So there's wisdom deeper in that language that as English readers, we wouldn't necessarily, wouldn't necessarily see without hearing these multiple translations. And I think that's really fitting for a mindful practice, for mindfulness practice, and how we show up for ourselves. As someone who lives with and manages chronic pain, um, I had the realization a couple of weeks ago during this quarantine that supporting Clarity of mind and mental health and spiritual health requires more than I did pre-quarantine. And a physical metaphor made this really clear. 
most of the time now I do pretty well with very little pain as long as I'm getting enough activity and enough stretching and physical care for my body. Sometimes, maybe once or twice a week, I need uh, like a prescription strength ibuprofen. And then a couple of times a year, I need a very strong prescription medication to get me through a pain flare. So I was kind of thinking that my mind should take care of itself, that this is the equivalent of a mental pain flare, but I should just be doing stretching extra well that I would usually do, and that should be enough. Well, that's not true in our physical body, so why should that be true in our mental health? We like to think that our minds will just take care of themselves, but that's not true. We have to take care of them just like any other part of our bodies. And this is wisdom that goes back millennia. So we think about these in neurological terms um, because of our scientific research and discovery. This is a great way for us to understand what's happening neurologically. Um, and it's fascinating and opening all sorts of ways to treat the mind uh, and treat uh, mental illness and promote health and wellness, which then has a direct impact on our bodies because it's interconnected and then on our being in the community. But for millennia, uh, the careful observers of the human condition in our religious traditions have known this to be true. And in every religious tradition, there are contemplative spiritual practices to bring calm to the mind and the nervous system. So in the Western tradition, these are chants, the monastic communities, Lexio Divina, which is a, a contemplative form of reading sacred text um, in a meditative way, um, meditative forms of prayer, um, church music is, is part of that, and that's something we practice here at First Unitarian. Um, and in the mystical traditions throughout the world, there are ways to tap into this physical reality of how our bodies and minds are wired. And so it is an important practice. And I like to think that if I do a little bit, then that's all I need. And it turns out not to be true. It's very much like exercising. You know, you start like, I'm gonna start this new exercise plan. And I've worked out really hard for three days now. And I'm really disappointed that I'm not in super great shape. It takes time. I know when I meditate regularly, it takes me about four weeks before I start to notice a difference in how my brain is functioning. And it's somewhat like riding a bike, a balance between a certain engagement and a certain just utter presence um, and stepping back from the usual patterns of thought. And that's a new way of functioning neurologically. Um, and it can be tremendously transformative. So I was thinking about that this week and thinking about this metaphor of the mud or the sediment settling. And so I created an experiment to see what this looks like visually. So in the church garden, I poured sand into a large vase. When I started this project, I thought that it would settle in about 10 minutes and I was going to make a neat and tidy time-lapse video that would show A to Z, 10 minutes done, and I would then make it even shorter for the purposes of worship. It turns out, just like my thoughts about meditation and exercise, there is no instant gratification here, and this is a far, far better metaphor and example for the reality of mindfulness and um, use of spiritual technologies and practice. So we're gonna go outside to the garden and see how our experiment has gone. Now I thought it would settle in about 10 minutes and that would be that. And it has taken 20, 122 hours to get to this point. And you can see you still can't quite see through it. Um, it will probably take another 24 hours uh, to become completely clear because that's a lot of sand and a lot of sediment um, uh, for a relatively small amount of water. So like the sand in this water, it takes time for us to care for our minds and our spirits and to do so regularly. 
So let's go back inside the church and have a little practice together at a couple simple breathing exercises that can help ground and center us in a way that we can build on bit by bit, day by day, to help our mind go clear as well. I wanna teach you a technique called square breathing. This is something I've used in the hospital with patients when I've served as a chaplain and on a detox unit. The beauty of it is it's very simple and it does work pretty quickly uh, to calm our nervous system, slow our heart rate and reduce our blood pressure. So I invite you to get a little comfortable with where you're sitting, feel the points of contact with the chair or the floor, um, wherever position, if you can keep your spine straight and something grounded on the floor, that will help. Take a few deep breaths to get started. Calm yourself and put your hands gently in your lap. You can find a point to gaze at, or you might wanna close your eyes. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let you gaze at the rose window if you like, because I know for many people, it is an image of beauty among our community and one of contemplation. Now for square breathing, You'll inhale for four counts, hold for four counts, and exhale for four counts. Wait four counts, and then inhale for four counts. So on and so forth, like you're tracing the path around a square. Now everyone's exact counts may vary. Your pacing of your counts uh, based on your lung capacity and how you're feeling that day. But to demonstrate, I'll count you off so that we can all take a few breaths together. Inhale, one, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four. Wait, two, three, four. Inhale, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Inhale. Hold. Exhale. One, two, three, four. So you can adapt this for your own pace, depending on where you at are at in a given day and your mood and how your body is feeling. Pretty quickly, because we have control of uh, the voluntary aspect of our breathing, we can then use that as a tool to impact how our bodies and our minds are functioning. And when we do that, we start to be able to see our world and those around us with greater clarity. It may take time of working on this every day and it may take time in every session before we really notice a difference. I had a um, student at one point who was practicing meditation with me, um, follow her practice for a couple of weeks. And when she met with me for further uh, direction. She said, okay, I've been doing it. What next? And I said, well, we just keep doing it. And she said, but I finished doing it. And I said, well, kind of keep doing it for the rest of our lives. It's like walking or eating nutrition, breathing clean air. These are things that we need an ongoing way to replenish ourselves. And we often think that our brains will just take care of themselves, but they need care just like every other aspect of us. And when we care for ourselves, that has a really big impact on the world. And that is true. The, uh, in the writers of that sacred text remember that the same words pointed to divergent realities that are interconnected. Do we have the patience until our mud becomes clear? And then by stillness, little by little, make what is troubled and the broader world clear. And there couldn't be more of a time when the broader world is troubled 
And that time calls for even more clarity of mind and peace that we can cultivate in our own bodies, minds, and spirits. And may a bit of that peace be with you now and in the week to come. Take care. As Meredith and Renee extinguish the chalice, please join us in saying these words. Though the flame is extinguished, we carry with us the warmth of community, the light of truth, and the fire of commitment until we are together again. For just this moment, may we not seek nor expect, but just be that in this space, we may welcome all things. Our worship is over, but our service begins. Go forth in peace and be a blessing on the world. Amen.